You're listening to the N2K Space Network. We know that SpaceX is doing amazing things, and they also get a lot of the attention out there in the world, sometimes to the unfair exclusion of other great things that are going on. Here at T-Minus, we try to do our best to make sure we cover the whole gamut of what's happening in space. But sometimes that does just mean quite a bit of SpaceX news, like today. Today, we've got a whole Musk myriad, a slew of SpaceX stories, if you will. So let's take a look at what's going on. T-minus, 20 seconds to LOS, T-dress, go for the floor. Today is July 31st, 2023. I'm Maria Varmazis, and this is T Minus. SpaceX tests its new flame deflector water deluge system. Elon Musk says SpaceX provided its knowledge of crewed parachute systems to Boeing. The U.S. Air Force awards Sierra Space Corporation a new contract. And our guest today is Doug Milburn, co-founder of Protocase, on the evolution to proto space MFG and rapid innovation and prototyping for the space industry. Stay with us. Now here's our Intel briefing for this Monday. First up, there were videos on Friday of a deluge at Boca Chica. SpaceX was kicking the tires on the new flame deflector water deluge system, which is meant to dampen the effects of a massive launch. That, in turn, could help prevent future incidents of that nasty flying chunks of concrete problem that we saw with the Starship orbital flight test back in April. These deluge systems have been a common sight on many a launch pad over the years, Its omission in the first Starship flight test left many watchers wondering why. Well, SpaceX has been working on it, looks like. Only problem seems to be, according to CNBC, that the company did not have and didn't even apply for the environmental permits needed to flood the delicate wetlands surrounding the launch site with the deluge of wastewater, in this case called industrial process water. Environmental permits for industrial process water are required as part of the Federal Clean Water Act and would mandate both treatment and safe disposal. Penalties for not complying with this can include fines up to $50,000 a day. Right now, Texas state environmental regulators are actively evaluating the water deluge system to determine if environmental laws were actually violated. Undoubtedly, the plaintiffs suing SpaceX and the FAA for environmental damages from the Starship OFT are watching this with great interest, as are we. Now on to the second SpaceX story for you, and this one's leaving us scratching our heads a little bit. In response to a tweet or post or X or whatever we're supposed to call them now by Eric Berger of Ars Technica about Boeing's financial losses on Starliner so far, as sometimes happens, Elon Musk himself took to his thumbs and replied directly, saying this, SpaceX provided its knowledge of crewed parachute systems to Boeing, and we are happy to be helpful in any other ways. Designing parachutes for orbital crewed spacecraft is much harder than it may seem, was a major challenge for SpaceX. So that's an interesting note. Side commentary online about this note from Musk was that this is a great example of coopetition, because space is hard, but what we don't know is when this information was shared, because that kind of changes how you read this rather considerably. Was this information sharing done a while ago, yet the shoot woes persisted, or were they shared much more recently when the woes came to light? Likely, we will find out from Boeing themselves sooner or later. And lastly, a quick rundown of a story in Futurism's The Bite that we're linking for you in the show notes. The headline for this one is, FAA throws cold water on SpaceX's next Starship orbital launch. And the crux of this story is that Starship is indefinitely grounded pending FAA approvals, despite what Elon Musk might be saying about the next orbital launch attempt happening sooner rather than later. So is this a bit of a nothing burger or not? 
Give the story a read for yourself and decide. We've linked it at space.n2k.com. Okay, last one. Speaking of SpaceX, now this one's related, but not about Elon Musk anymore, I promise. Maxar Technologies has announced that the Jupiter 3 satellite is performing as expected after launching on a Falcon Heavy last week. Maxar built the enormous satellite for Hughes Network Systems, joining four other satellites that Maxar has built for the company. The 14 solar panels on board the Jupiter 3 can span a 10-story building. Now, Jupiter 3, which is also known as Echo Star 24, if I can do my Latin numerals correctly, will double the capacity of the Hughes satellite fleet, providing an additional 500 gigabytes per second of capacity over the United States, Canada, Mexico, and countries in South America. It will also give HughesNet much-needed capacity as the satellite operator is maxed out on its current fleet and is losing customers due to competition from, who else? SpaceX's Starlink. Moving on from SpaceX now, the U.S. Air Force has awarded Sierra Space Corporation a $22.6 million U.S. dollar contract for the maturation of the Vortex Advanced Upper Stage Engine, known as VR35KA. The company aims to advance the development of its 35,000-pound thrust upper stage engine during the 27-month term. Sierra Space has been working on the VR35KA engine design for several years with support from the Air Force Research Laboratory. The company completed a critical design review for the engine in August of last year. The contract provides for leveraging the test data from the first Phase 3 Small Business Innovation Research Component, or SIBR component, and integrated breadboard engine test to develop flight weight engine component designs. The contract was awarded as a sole source acquisition, and the work is expected to be completed by October 2025. A British-built weather monitoring satellite was successfully deorbited over the Atlantic Ocean on Friday. This is the first time a defunct satellite has performed an assisted re-entry. The European Space Agency satellite called Aeolus was not originally designed for a controlled re-entry at the end of its mission, but ESA decided to use what little fuel was on board to steer the vehicle back to Earth. The re-entry comes after a series of complex maneuvers that lowered the vehicle's orbit from an altitude of 320 kilometers to just 120 kilometers to re-enter the atmosphere and burn up. These maneuvers positioned Aeolus so that any pieces that didn't burn up in the atmosphere would fall within the satellite's planned Atlantic ground tracks. ESA used the mission to gather data for future satellite re-entries and to demonstrate best practices in the hope that other spacefaring nations and organizations will one day follow suit. The Indian Space Research Organization held a successful launch of its Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle on Sunday, carrying seven Singaporean-owned satellites. The PSLV C-56 rocket was launched at the Satish Dhawan Space Center in Sriharikota. The main payload was the DSSAR satellite designed to image Earth in radar light and was developed jointly by Singapore's Defense Science and Technology Agency and the company ST Engineering. And speaking of Indian space, it's been confirmed that the object that washed up on the beach in Western Australia is, in fact, debris from a polar satellite launch vehicle. India's space chief says that the giant metal dome that was found just north of Perth in mid-July is indeed from their vehicle, but it's up to Australia to decide what to do with the space junk. Nice. The China Aerospace Science and Technology Corporation has held a static fire test for its 3.35-meter diameter general-purpose hydrogen-oxygen engine. According to Chinese media, the new 10-ton engine is capable of meeting future needs of new-generation, medium-sized launch vehicles and is suitable for rapid launch of rockets in batches. And there's something about the Voyager missions that makes a lot of space geeks get a little weepy, myself included. And I hate to be the bearer of potentially sad news here, but... Voyager 2, a space probe that was launched in 1977 to study interstellar space, is on a communications pause. NASA says that a series of planned commands sent to the spacecraft on July 21st 
inadvertently caused the antenna to point two degrees away from Earth. As a result, Voyager 2 is currently unable to receive commands or transmit data back to Earth. Voyager 2 is currently located more than 12.3 billion miles from Earth and is programmed to reset its orientation multiple times each year to keep its antenna pointing at Earth. So, let's hold on to hope here. The next reset will occur on October 15th, which NASA hopes will enable communication to resume. In the meantime, dear universe, a request from this pale blue dot, please look after Voyager 2. And on that sad note, we have come to the end of today's Intel briefing. But to cheer you and I up, we've included all the stories we've covered today in our show notes and added a few more for you to read at space.n2k.com. Hey, T-Minus crew. Every Monday, we produce a written intelligence roundup. It's called Signals and Space. And if you happen to miss any T-Minus episodes, this strategic intelligence product will get you up to speed in the fastest way possible. It's all signal, no noise. You can sign up for Signals and Space in our show notes or at space.n2k.com. Our guest for today's interview is Doug Milburn. He's the co-founder of Protocase. Now, Protocase has moved their space manufacturing under the new brand of Protospace MFG. I spoke to Doug about the new branding, but we began our conversation by asking about how his company got started. So my business partner and I were both engineers. I'm a PhD in mechanical engineering, and uh, my co-founder was CEO of a marine navigation company. We're innovators and we built stuff and I was trying to get parts, the sheet metal parts, machine parts, etc. It was, oh, it's just a pain. And they're critical to building things. And, you know, at the innovative level, the low volume level, most suppliers weren't really interested in our work. What we did, we started up a company and it was, what would we dream of? We dream of having somebody that would take our jobs, small, medium jobs, either for innovation and development or for low volume manufacturing. And that somebody would take those jobs seriously and do them fast. So we built a company called Protocase, centered around electronic enclosures, but quickly became parts and machine parts. And uh, we built fully finished metal, fabricated, machined, painted, welded, everything on fasteners, uh, printing on it in two to three days. It was like 2003 when we started it. And, you know, we're now, you know, the name. So early on, before they should have, we've had people in the aerospace industry who come and buy from us. And it was guerrilla purchasing. You know, it was, yeah, I can buy this on my credit card. I know you're not in the approved supplier list. And we didn't have proper quality certifications, whatever else. But they used it for auxiliary items. You know, we weren't going in flight parts back then. And we built up, you know, 35% of our business was in aerospace. And despite the fact we didn't check the boxes, what we ended up doing is we said, well, let's check the boxes for aerospace customers. So we became AS9100 certified. And then we put in traceability, traceability systems. A lot of the defense industry crosses over, of course. So we became ITAR, Canadian Control of Goods, certified as well. So all of a sudden we check the major boxes for getting in that supply chain. And next thing you know, we're 19 of the top 20 aerospace majors buying from us. All the private space people, in fact, our, our biggest segment is private space. You know, so we're in, in what we call traditional aerospace and also in what we call new aerospace. Yeah, and we just ended up in those worlds. And uh, six months ago, we soft launched our uh, protospace MFG division. And what that's about is that you know, we've kind of co-mingled our, our aerospace and non-aerospace business and so many of our customers, aerospace customers have moved over to, the, you know, to, to the, the protospace MFG side of it. My background before I started doing space stuff was in tech. So I knew about protocase through that avenue. So hearing about protospace was very exciting. The protocase name is so well known. And the turnaround in and of itself is a, a massive, massive innovation and really something that's that's really incredible. Uh, I don't think that gets appreciated enough, honestly. What we've found is, you know, 
particularly in the new aerospace business. These people, it's do or die for them. They got to get the rockets going up. And if they don't, the money runs out. And you know, the ones that get that, they adopt our technique or adopt our processes and everything just accelerates dramatically. They get to project completion. They get time to do iterations you know, before the project deadlines happen. And it's just game changing. You mentioned the processes. Can you talk about that as well, what, what those processes are and, and how that helps speed things along? You know, if you look at ordering fast, it tends to be small orders. When I say small orders, everything in aerospace is a small order to manufacturers, right? There's no such thing as volume. Automotive has volume. Consumer has volume. Aerospace doesn't have volume. Boutique. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, very boutique. And when you do, and you look at ordering stuff for a development project and you need you know, three enclosures or 17 brackets or, you know, five machine bearing mounts or something like that. The manufacturing time in that, and even though you get long lead times, there's not much manufacturing time in it, right? So what we've done is we've just, just crunched it down, the idea of manufacturing velocity, the amount of time that you work on it versus the totally lapsed time. We really maximize manufacturing velocity in that end of it. But we can't start that until our customers signed off with a you know, fully detailed solid model and, and all their specifications. So trying to get to that and help people get to that, to get to that, they need to do a design. The design has to embody the manufacturer's constraints such that it can be made by the manufacturer. Okay? The manufacturer has to interpret it properly because if they make a mistake interpreting, you're getting garbage, right? Your design intent has to be embodied in the final Okay, and, and we look at that and we go, it's very costly to you, the customer, if a mistake gets made anywhere because it's delaying you. There's two large routes. Number one is you design it in your CAD. You got to put your constraints in. Our, our website is very, very information rich. And we have everything teaching people about these manufacturing processes and, and what you can do, what you can't, and all the ins and outs to help you get your design right. Uh, once... We get a solid model from you. We get it into our system. Everything inside, uh, you know, most places, uh, there's a lot of manual operational engineering that goes into making work instructions. Well, if you're doing a small order of parts, that's the dominant cost inside the manufacturer. So we've automated that all. Once we get a solid model, basically our operational people, operational engineers, they spend time with the customer, make sure and design intent and constraints are looked after and that you get to a solid model that is right for you and going to make you happy. Once they do that, we use automation. Why do you use automation? Well, it reduces costs, but that's not the, do- the dominant thing is that we don't make mistakes. It's about quality. It's, it's not just about getting it fast. It's about getting it right as well. And we can be status quo and we can be AS9100 certified and we can still make mistakes, but our quality system covers them. That doesn't help you, right? So that accuracy, automation, everywhere we can, and really getting your operational focused and getting you, the buyer, understanding the constraints and, and helping you get to a good solid model. We have software called Protocase Designer. Yes, yep. And right now, uh, you can go on there and you can design custom electronic enclosures. You can also make certain sheet metal parts in that. When you make them in that, the constraints are imposed at design time. The design is incredibly easy. You don't have to be a mechanical engineer to use it. And then the design is automatically manufacturable. And uh, that software understands and our web servers understands what it is you design so it can get you a quote instantly. So you design some custom, no waiting two days or three days or a week to get a price and then scratch your head, say, not good, let me cycle again. So it just completely accelerates everything. We live in the future. I didn't know that was possible. It goes right from the engineer's brain into software, right through our plant and FedEx. It's, it's all automated, which is how we handle, you know, small jobs, aerospace scale jobs so quickly. I wanted to transition talking to you a bit about what ProtoSpace's involvement is with, or was with the Spaceport America Cup, because my understanding is that you guys were a sponsor and that you were working with a lot of the students. So I'd love to know a little bit more about how you worked with the students and also kind of what you guys got back from that experience as well. Quite a while ago, we adopted the... Um, the university rover competition, you know, university student competition, but parallel, they're building Mars rovers, right? We help sponsor the competition, you know, it's not for profit and uh, we, we do some direct sponsorship uh, 
and we give them several thousand dollars worth of service. So it's an in-kind sponsorship to the teams. So we've done the same thing in Spaceport. And it was our first year getting involved with it, and it actually our involvement wasn't publicized. And you know, it's just we we got we got to the game late this year with Spaceport. It's learning. We're we're in this for the long game and everything, in, right? So uh, you know, next year will be the the big one for us. But University Rover has been a real success. And to teach these teams, you know, it's the same thing that our our customers have figured out how to change their operations. It's like you, you create a company that's doing rocket science. You know, if your team focuses on rocket science. And not on things like, you know, university teams, they'll go, tend to go, okay, great, here's our design. Okay, we got to build this now. Okay, I'll go to the student shop and I will become an amateur machinist, something that I'm not going to be doing in my career. And uh, I'll make amateur parts and, uh, and it'll take me a bunch of time because I'm bumbling and fumbling. And what we say to these teams is think about, number one, an optimized design and, and how you're going to get it manufactured as quickly as possible. Focus on your core and where you guys add your value, which is designing this, get your team to execute and, and everything else and figure out what you can get rid of that is reinventing the wheel that's been done since 1700. Don't waste your time on that. So we basically train them in that idea of get back to the core that, you know, a lot of engineers have kind of, they get, they get into that and that, that carries into groups they're in, in in their profession. And it's like the groups that, student groups that get that, the ones that got that and really adopted the whole concept, they get to prototype super fast. And when they get the prototype, then they get to try it. And then we, we teach something inside here called project DNA about how to get projects done well. And we talk about known unknowns, using experimentation to get through those. And then you go for your prototype where it all comes together. We call it one of your end-to-end moments where you put something together that actually works, it's supposed to work. And then the unknown unknowns come out and bite you. And they will not invite them out until you get to your end-to-end moment and try to make that happen. Faster it happens, sooner you get to know what they are, the better you can wrestle them to the ground and get something that works. And that's true in everything. And whether you're private space, you know, on the, on the you know, cutting edge of, of, of the revolution that's happening there, uh, all those project DNA principles understand why you need to get the prototype as fast as you can as inexpensive as you can why you're gonna fail and and it's about picking yourself up dusting it off that's where you go so that's what the student competition is all about and we'll be right back Welcome back. Now, it feels like it was only yesterday when ESA's Euclid telescope was launched. It was actually almost a month ago, July 1st to be precise. And can you believe it? About 30 days later, Euclid is already at its home at Lagrange Point 2, hanging out with a James Webb Space Telescope and ESA's Gaia probe. And it just sent back its first commissioning images from both its near-infrared and visual imagers. And my God, it's full of stars and swirling galaxies and some blobby artifacts from sunlight sneaking in and even a few errant streaks from cosmic rays, but mostly just an absolute smorgasbord of gorgeous stars. The Euclid telescope will be fully calibrated and ready to start work in about another two months or so. But even just these first calibration images are astounding. The area that this first image is looking at is merely a quarter of the width and height of the full moon, says Isa. Euclid will also help us better understand dark matter and dark energy, and if Einstein's theory of general relativity holds up on a super-mega-massive cosmic scale. But in the meantime, we can also enjoy some gorgeous pictures. A closing quote here from Euclid project manager Giuseppe Rocca. After more than 11 years of designing and developing Euclid, it's exhilarating and enormously emotional to see these first images. It's even more incredible when we think that we see just a few galaxies here produced with minimum system tuning. The fully calibrated Euclid will ultimately observe billions of galaxies to create the biggest ever 3D map of the sky. That's it for T-Minus for July 31st, 2023. 
For additional resources from today's report, check out our show notes at space.n2k.com. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. You can email us at space at n2k.com or submit the survey in the show notes. Your feedback ensures that we deliver the information that keeps you a step ahead in the rapidly changing space industry. We're privileged that N2K and podcasts like T-Minus are part of the daily routine of many of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K Strategic Workforce Intelligence optimizes the value of your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your team while making your team smarter. Learn more at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Alice Carruth. Mixing by Elliot Peltzman and Trey Hester. With original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Brandon Karpf. Our chief intelligence officer is Eric Tillman. And I'm Maria Varmazis. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.